All right, I think we will begin. So good afternoon. Welcome to today's panel, Social Media Governance, Content Moderation and Democracy. Uh, I'm Professor Michael Pollack, and on behalf of the Florsheimer Center for Constitutional Democracy, I wanna thank you all for joining us today. I also wanna thank our program administrator, Maura Gingrich for her invaluable assistance and gratefully acknowledge the co-sponsorship of the Cardozo, Cardozo Data Law Initiative, the Cardozo Women in Tech Law Student Group, and the Heyman Center on Corporate Governance. So now let me briefly introduce our three panelists and then I will get out of the way so you can hear from these three experts. We will leave time for Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function here in Zoom to submit those questions as you have them. And we'll go through them uh, during the Q&A time. So uh, in no particular order other than alphabetical, first we have uh, Genevieve Lakier. Professor Lakier is, is Assistant Professor of Law and the Herbert and Marjorie Freed Teaching Scholar at the University of Chicago Law School. Professor Lakier's research explores the connections between culture and law with a particular focus on the First Amendment, cyberspace, and as of recently, deplatforming. She's a graduate of Princeton University, earned her master's and PhD from the University of Chicago, and her JD from the NYU Law School, where she was not only my classmate, but my 1L section mate. So the friends you make during your 1L year come back in your life or stay in your life for a long time, and it's great to see them accomplish great things and join you to talk about their expertise. All right, second, we have Kate Klonick. Professor Klonick is Assistant Professor of Law at St. John's University School of Law. Her research centers on law and technology and on network technology's effect on social norm enforcement, freedom of expression, and private governance. And she is perhaps the foremost scholar on the Facebook Oversight Board, which I'm sure we'll be hearing more about from her today. Uh, Professor Klonick is a graduate of Brown University, earned her JD from Georgetown Law School, and her PhD in Law from Yale Law School, where she was also a resident fellow of the Information Society Project. Last but certainly not least, our very own Felix Wu is Professor of Law here at Cardozo. As many of you surely know, Professor Wu is an expert on freedom of speech, privacy law, intellectual property law, and information governance. Uh, Professor Wu is a graduate of Harvard University and earned his JD and PhD at the University of California at Berkeley. So quite the extraordinary trio, and we are exceptionally grateful to have them with us today. I also wanna say you can find links to their published scholarship on the Florsheimer Center's Twitter feed at Florsheimer CTR. That's F-L-O-E-R-S-H-E-I-M-E-R CTR. It's a great thread uh, from earlier today with links to a lot of their scholarship if you wanna read more uh, after our talk. So with that, let me turn things over to Professor Wu to moderate our discussion, thanks. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited uh, to have this panel here today and to, to talk about the problems of uh, content moderation and social media governance. So the, you know, I'm sure we've all heard about the, the issue with, with Trump being, um, you know, removed from, from Facebook, from Twitter. And that example is, I think, only the most high profile of what is a much, much bigger issue, right? This question of um, what kind of content stays, what kind of content goes on a platform like Facebook, Twitter, uh, other social media platforms, platforms like YouTube or otherwise, right? Um, and so there are a lot of different angles that one can take in thinking about this problem. Uh, one can, one can uh, think about, you know, allegations of political bias. One can think about the question of liability. One can think about uh, particular kinds of content, whether it's hate speech or misinformation or the like. In this panel, we're going to take um, a particular approach. And the approach here is to try to think about process, governance. And in particular, to try to think about, well, how are these choices being made? And what kind of a system could we imagine setting up that would make these choices better? And to what extent is that system gonna be designed just by Facebook or by other people, by the government, by some sort of regulation or other sorts of, you know, uh, um, other sorts of, of, of restrictions essentially on what Facebook's choices uh, really are. Um, and so that's the kind of big picture question, I think, that we're going to that we're going to try to tackle today. And when I say tackle, I mean, we're going to try to explore it at least, because um, as I was saying to the panelists uh, uh, before, when we were, you know, sort of discussing this, um, I think some of the questions here are some of some some of the ones that I find the most vexing. You know, my my students uh, don't often hear what I think about various kinds of areas, but sometimes they do. And usually they can get a pretty clear view about a lot of things. This to me is actually not one of them. So I'm really excited actually to um, have this great group of folks to, with which to try to explore uh, these kinds of issues. Um, so we're going to start first with Professor Klonick, um, who 
Uh, I, I think it's fair to say is basically the world's leading expert on content moderation at this point, um, having ha know, knowing I think more about more about how these things work um, than than pretty much anybody I know. Um, uh, certainly any academic I know, I guess I should say. Uh, and uh, and so we're going to start with her to just talk a little bit about just the problem of content moderation generally, um, and then a little bit more about some of the systems that have already been set up, like how does Facebook content moderation work, and, um, and, and what about this new oversight board uh, that Facebook has set up. So we'll start there. Great. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a lovely event. And Felix, like your your you know your work was some of the the stuff that completely formulated my thoughts about like what was happening in this world of private governance when I first started writing about this and Genevieve I've loved all of your work so this is kind of going to be a tremendous day and panel uh, I I think I'll just start with kind of where I I started some of the empirical work for my research which is not I'm not going to I'm going to leave to section 230 and the first amendment to you guys and kind of let you explore that but I will talk about Assuming that, uh, taking the assumption that the U.S. government cannot directly directly regulate how these private platforms can have speech because they have this, uh, because they're limited by the First Amendment. And assuming that there is like a bubble in which that Section 230, and we can talk about this later, Section 230 creates kind of an incubation for self-regulation for these companies uh, to protect them from civil liability. You have this problem of how these companies are going to self-regulate in that space. Um, and that was kind of the problem that I came to in 2015, which seems like a very long time ago, even though it was only six years ago. Uh, but there was really at that point, I think content moderation was just starting to be talked about. And people were just starting to realize um, that, wow, there is all of this stuff that's going up on these platforms and that is being taken down by these platforms and we have no transparency into how this is happening. We have no idea what the process is or if there are any, um, what they're, what's being done for all of these uh, different platforms and how they remove speech from users if they decide violates their community standards, what their community standards even are. We had very, there were almost no uh, there was almost no kind of visibility into the exact parameters of what the community standards and the various sites were besides kind of a very anodyne listing of uh, forbidden types of content. And so one of the things that I tried to work to uncover um, starting in 2015 was to talk to people about how actually these systems developed internally to take down good speech and to, uh, or sorry, to take down bad speech and keep up good speech. And this is kind of the hard decision, right? It would be easy if you wanted to be a platform to just take down a lot of stuff. Like you could just be overly sensorial, but that was not what people wanted. And in fact, it was antithetical to the business model of these platforms. And it was antithetical to like the business, to like the theorized kind of philosophy that a lot of these American companies and the people who ran them had grown up with, which was very kind of free speech philic. And so there was a, there was a, 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 a real question. Um, and Genevieve, this is for you and for University of Chicago. It was a it was a transition from standards to rules. Uh, sorry, I know. Um, but it really was. So, like, think about the community that Facebook was in two thousand four to two thousand and eight. For instance, it was mostly kind of college age students on this platform, mostly in America, had not been globalized yet, it had not been opened to really or used by people outside of that community. And by two thousand eight, it really was. And so. In two, from 2004 to 2008, um, we had, you know, kind of this this set of standards, as I as I kind of put it, because it was more or less, even though there was lots of variation, there was some sense that this was a community and they had norms, and those norms were, uh, if you if it makes you feel bad, take it down. If it's hit, if it's Hitler, take it down. If it's like you know, if it's pictures of penises, take them down. Like if it's, you know, this is kind of how they, that's kind of how they moderated everything. As you kind of move towards um, a much larger audience, there, it's not just scale that becomes an issue, like the pure number of tweets or the pure number of amount of content that's going, being created and going up. Although that's a, ma a massive problem. It's that you have to serve the norms of all of the communities that you're going into. And there is no such thing as a global set of norms. 
uh, for for what we expect as a, as a global community to stay up or come down. You're never going to get a point that Iran and France agree about female nudity. And these are the types of things that you had, that these platforms had just various choices of whether they were going to decide to almost be kind of to export American values into some of these places, if they were going to decide that they were going to geoblock certain types of content within certain types of jurisdictions, or if they were going to be doing things that were uh, just make everyone conform to their set of standards that didn't make anyone happy, didn't make France or Iran particularly happy, but met some type of like milk toast middle. Um, and so that's kind of, there was a, a massive amount of stuff that was happening on the private side. And it really wasn't until 2018 or 2017, even though there had been plenty of civil society groups and um, especially communications academics and things like that that had been studying this, really wasn't until 2018 that it just really started to hit um, hit the media in a, in, a, in a massive way. And there started to become this global reckoning with the fact that we had this huge power imbalance between, um, between speakers on the one hand that were completely dependent on these platforms. And then, uh, and then, you know, really just no idea how to even begin regulating. And I think that as Felix will talk about, this was like the main problem. We're going to talk about the First Amendment. We're going to talk about 230. But the real thing that's so tricky about this, this particular, about all of these platforms is that they're transnational. They're not international, they're not global. They exist both within and between all of these different countries. And it's really, it's a hard case to make that any one country would have the power to really change any of these platforms and how they govern because they could just, you know, they just, they don't need Iran. They can just turn off Facebook in Iran and like be somewhere else as we saw, just saw with everything that happened with Australia um, a couple of weeks ago. So I will leave it there um, and let uh, Felix kind of talk about the regulatory environment that was created in the mid nineties uh, in the US that kind of incubated and like kind of fostered a lot of um, the self-regulation that these companies engaged in. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Great. Um, one thing we're going to come back to also is more on the Facebook oversight board. So, we'll, so we'll, we'll, I'll come back to you on that in a second. But first, let's talk a little bit about, um, as, as Professor Klonik was describing, the kind of, you know, the, the legal structure within which um, these decisions are being made, right? Um, so the first sort of legal principle here is largely a principle of non-liability. Um, and that's the principle that we get out of Section 230. So I'm going to spend a moment talking about that. Um, and then I'm going to throw it over to Professor Lake here to talk a bit more about the First Amendment in this context and the way in which that interacts with the, um, uh, the, the choices that are available essentially um, uh, to the world. So um, with respect to Section 230, as I said, the principle is pretty much one of non-liability. So this is a federal statute. And so we could, of course, imagine just amending the federal statute. And indeed, there's a lot of movement right now to amend that federal statute in various directions. Um, though I will note, you know, people who tell you everyone agrees that it should get amended are hiding the fact that the people who agree it should get amended want to amend it in the opposite direction. So, you know, so that does not tell you that something is in fact going to happen. But in any event, um, the basic principle from Section 230, which says, uh, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of information provided by another information content provider. It basically says, look, Facebook is not responsible for the content they carry. Right? They're not liable in some sense when they, when they say something false, uh, when they say something that invades someone's privacy, um, when, they, when, when, they, when, some, when one of their users does one of these things. Right? Facebook is not liable even when they carry it. Um, and even if, even if in fact they have notice, even in fact uh, Facebook knows that some user is saying this particular thing on their platform, right? which could be the first hump for them to even just find out about it. Right? But, um, but even if they know about it, um, they're not liable. Now, of course, there are exceptions to this. There's exceptions to, for copyright infringement, exceptions for federal criminal law, and most recently, ex an exception for sex trafficking laws. Um, but the broad brush of kinds of things that you might worry about um, on, a, on a platform, a lot of them are just going to be covered by this, um, as to which Facebook is not liable. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they won't do anything. And for all the reasons that we're talking about here, they, they, they can and do do things. And then the question is, what will they decide to do? But it's largely a decision that they're making rather than a decision that they're making uh, on the basis of the, the government telling them that they have to make these decisions one way or another. Here's the thing though. One interesting, I think, still open question under Section 230 is how much this does or does not permit the government to directly uh, um, regulate the content moderation processes themselves. 
Now, Facebook, of course, would try to tell you, no, Section 230 definitely precludes that, right? Because content moderation is part of the, the role that Section 230 is meant to protect. I have previously argued that, in fact, Section 230 should not be interpreted nearly this broadly, um, and that instead, what it really is doing is preventing Facebook from being held liable for the kinds of underlying speech torts or speech, speech claims that the users themselves could be held liable for, which is not at all the same thing as actually regulating the process by which they go about actually moderating content. And so that is at least the sort of starting point, um, you know, again, in terms, of, in terms of the choices that they're making and the extent to which uh, they're free to make mo moderation choices. Although, as I said, I think Section 230 actually does leave open the possibility of directly regulating the process itself, which is part of what we'll get to in a second. So now let me turn it over to Professor Lake here to talk a little bit about, well, okay, so even if Section 230 uh, doesn't necessarily uh, uh, mean we can't, we can't regulate the, the platforms directly, what does the First Amendment have to say about this? Okay, great. That's a great segue, actually, because Felix, when you were uh, in your last remarks, I was thinking, okay, Section 230 doesn't interfere with this, uh, this possibility of imposing some kind of restrictions, but what about the First Amendment? So this, um, thank you for asking me that question directly. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just say, just to add to that, that I think there are proposals right now to use Section 230 reform as a kind of um, a carrot and a stick in order to incentivize the platforms to engage in more procedure when it comes to content moderation. And so there is right now, I mean, this is a really live regulatory issue, whether or not if there is, and this goes back to the, the question about, you know, everyone agrees 230 should be reformed, but the uh, array of ways in which it could be reformed are limitless, it seems. Everyone has their own uh, proposal, but one of the things right now really on the table is to use the carrot of Section 230 immunity as a means of incentivizing content moderation practices. And um, this raises all kinds of First Amendment questions. So before I get there, I, I wanna step back and actually uh, pick up something that Kate earlier said, um, which is um, that the underlying fact uh, of the matter that these companies are transnational, that should be affecting and influencing our regulatory conversation in all kinds of ways. And I'll just say, for me, it's a bit of a challenge. So I come to the analysis of the platforms as a First Amendment person, really as a free speech person. I kind of wandered into cyberspace, surprise, surprisingly. Like this was, I was, I didn't grow up thinking I wanted to do content moderation. And I still feel very much like a newbie. Um, but it's really wonderful and interesting. I mean, I think this is the site where, as I'm going to say in a second, all kinds of, um, um, I guess, societal, political debates and uncertainties about the meaning of free speech are rising. We're really going back in some ways to first principles to think about what do we mean by freedom of speech when we are faced with the specter of speech on social media. So for a First Amendment person, it's great. On the other hand, it, it's constantly making me feel provincial because I'm just used to thinking about this domestic sphere of operation. And yet anytime our government or any other government regulates these companies, they're doing so, there are gonna be extraterritorial effects and there's gonna be constraints on their ability to exercise power because these companies are in some ways bigger than they are. Right? So in some ways, the United States government is more powerful than Facebook and Twitter, obviously, in all kinds of ways. Uh, but there are other ways in which, as we saw uh, with the debate over the dispute in Australia, where Facebook you know, threatened to pull out and the result was a cascading set of reactions from the Australian government. Uh, in some ways, the transnational scale and uh, influence, economic influence and power of these companies means that they have certain forms of influence and power that domestic governments are not going to want to contest. And so there is this sort of background question about how much are, is Congress going to be willing to regulate uh, um, uh, with an eye to what's the effect going to be on their bottom line and what about the political influence of these companies? Okay, but the transnational- Can I just have, have you yeah. pause for one second? Um, sure. you, uh, uh, explain the Australia thing, just for folks who hadn't heard about that, just because we've made a couple of references to it so far. So I just want to make sure people are on board with what that is about. Oh, sure. So Australia, the Australian Parliament introduced a bill. It was not yet law. It, it hadn't been enforced, but it was a draft bill. It looked like it was heading towards uh, enforcement. And Kate, feel free to correct me if I get any of the details wrong. That was going to um, require Facebook and any of the major platforms to pay money to news a, um, a select group of new corporate news sites that uh, were linked to on their pa pages. So if a user clicked on like a Fox News story on Facebook, Facebook would then have to pay Fox News to have that link embedded in Facebook. It was a transfer of money 
uh, from Facebook to the corporate news. And there's a sort of a, a good justification for what Australia was trying to do in the abstract, which is that uh, over the last um, 10 years, we've seen this massive flow of advertising data, uh, advertising money, sorry, from the traditional news media to platforms, particularly Facebook. I think Facebook has eaten up a huge proportion of this uh, because advertisers want the very targeted advertising, the wonderful placement that Facebook um, and uh, Google can give them. And so there's been this huge shift in the advertising revenues that is having a profoundly destabilizing effect on the traditional news media. And so there's lots of proposals on the table about what to do about it. Australia, which is, of course, home to Rupert Murdoch and to the very powerful News Corp and Rupert Murdoch, uh, old style news media, also has tremendous amount of political influence. And in internet debates, it is so often to think that the only baddies are the new social media companies. We should remember that corporate media has been playing a really complicated role in democracy, both here and in Australia and around the world for a long time. So Rupert Murdoch has lots of friends in the Australian parliament and manages to write a, bill, a law that is going to require Facebook and the other platforms to pay um, uh, many of uh, Rupert Mur News Corp owned <laughs> sites money every time they get clicked to. Facebook, of course, but all the social media platforms hate this. Um, I think for two reasons. One, they don't want to, they don't want their bottom line to um, be uh, impacted, right? That it's a, it's a, a weird kind of tax. But second, I think also uh, our, uh, don't like the design of the bill. This is because, remember, they're losing money anytime a user, someone not under their control or authority, makes an independent decision to link to a News Corp uh, story, say, on the Facebook feed. And so there is this, and I think a lot of social media and content moderation regulation people were worried. It does feel like a threat to the free internet because it means that there's going to be this incentive of these social media platforms to limit the ability of the users to click through because every time a, a user does that, it's going to uh, impact the bottom line. Anyway. All kinds of problems with this law, which uh, one can say, uh, one can read as a giveaway to the old major monopoly corporate media from the new. Uh, Facebook threatens to pull out of Australia altogether and then for a time stops linking to any Australian news sites on Facebook and not only in Australia, but worldwide. So people would go to, say, the Sydney Herald uh, uh, website, um, or they would try to link to it or get information, say, about the weather in Sydney on Facebook, and it was, it was nothing was blank. And so, you know, obviously this caused all kinds of uh, furor, uh, anxiety, although I actually think the, the politics of this were complicated because traffic, direct traffic to say the Sydney Herald's website increased. So one might think that some of these media sites thought, uh, might have thought that this was actually good, this is fine. If Facebook stops linking to our sites, it's okay. That was not the conclusion, and I think it is because they still are getting, on the whole, more click-through through Facebook than, so even though the direct click-throughs to their sites were increasing, it was not enough to make up the difference from the indirect click-throughs that they were still uh, deriving revenue and eyeballs from. And so there was real uh, political fallout from this, and uh, Facebook ends up making a deal, I think a pretty nice deal, with the local publishers to get, I guess, a subsidized rate, a lower rate, that it's going to pay and so and so now it's linking to australian news sites again the only thing that i would add is that before facebook before the, there's there's a there's a simultaneous there's a simultaneous story happening with the facebook deciding to delink everything mm -hmm. in in australia and that is that google had cut a deal before all of this happened had had already had the power and already been playing like been brokering in like these smoke filled rooms so to speak with these like news corps and large public publishers to get some type of sweetheart deal and facebook was like screw you we're going to like we're not going to like we're not going to engage in this type of um opaque behavior this is like Maybe I mean, there's a there's a story here about Facebook is actually like weirdly the hero, even though like they kind of got like hammered for for depriving Australia of like all of these news links and everything and playing this hardball. But anyways, I just want to like point out that like Google did the opposite. And that's just like a story of like that of like soft politics that is like as old as time itself in a lot of ways that we're like seeing, as you said before, play out again. Yeah, and I guess let me, let me let me pull that together just just quickly, right? I mean, partly whatever this whatever your view on this 
the, the outcome here, right? It clearly shows Facebook's power, right? And I think if anything else, it clearly shows their power in terms of their power here, even as against, you know, government, like, like government regular, even against the law, right? I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a direct power in the sense of literally they could claim some sort of higher law against them. It was just their power to actually, in the end, you know, make a deal like relative to what the government was trying to, was trying to do, to do with them. So. I guess I'll add, I'll add to that, actually, I think there are two takeaways, but they're kind of complicated. One is the power, which is where I started, the sheer power of these transnational corporations and the, the challenge that poses for lawyers and for regulators, because we're used to thinking of the state as the sovereign entity, the one with all the power in its hands and the, you know, and then we have to think about how to wield that tr tremendous power. Uh, but in this context, it's complicated who, what, there's shifting forms of power, there's economic power, there's political power, there's regulatory power, the sheer power to set the rules is a really significant part of power, but it is shared in this context between say Facebook and the reg uh, the governments. So it's a, it's a complicated uh, story about who is more powerful. But connected to that is also, I think, um, and Kate's edition really illuminates that, um, we should not be naive about that the government is the good guys and the social media platforms are the bad guys. Um, because of course, there's uh, often going to be very close coordination and connections between the two. You know, the problem with having an economy organized around really powerful, concentrated economic entities is not just their economic power, but they often have a lot of political power. And so we should be, I'm skeptical of, of the self-regulation. We're going to get there. Um, the, sort of self-regulation is the solution to our evils, but I also think we should be wary and skeptical of government regulation and government uh, regulation should be assessed critically. Um, I think then brings us back to the First Amendment, right? That'll, <laughs> that'll, that'll be a good segue back into where, where we left off. <laughs> Great, yeah, where we were trying to go. Okay, yeah. so, so I was saying, you know, for a First Amendment person, the transnational nature of this problem really makes me feel um, provincial in a way, because it means you have to think about all these other free speech regimes, not the, just the US. It has its pluses, though, which is that um, we should remember that Europe uh, has a different understanding of freedom of speech, their own free speech commitments. And Europe is acting, uh, not just Australia, many different governments, but um, the EU has been very aggressive in the past when it comes to thinking about uh, internet uh, regulation. And so um, what the First Amendment allows, and I'm going to argue that it allows quite a lot of regulation, um, um, is one thing, but it might be possible to imagine that, you know, the internet platforms are regulated, but they're regulated primarily by EU, by the EU, and then it's just too difficult or costly for them to develop entirely different internal regulatory regimes for different uh, domains. And so there is one story, which is that, you know, it doesn't really matter so much what the Europe, what the US does, because Europe is, is acting. I think for US lawyers and regulators that we should not be happy about that, right? The, it, um, uh, these, uh, the social media sites are really incredibly important um, places of political conversation, cultural conversation, public discourse in the US. They are a core part of the democratic public sphere. And so um, I think there is a certain kind of um, anxiety that the First Amendment doesn't allow the US government to regulate. And so maybe one response to that is, well, but Europe can still regulate. But I think that's a very unfortunate, that would be a very unfortunate conclusion that our own federal constitutional prohibits us from regulating to such an extent that we have to borrow from Europe. And I guess my view of the First Amendment is um, that it is intended to facilitate and, um, pr and protect a healthy democratic public sphere. And that surely does not mean that we have to depend upon other regulatory agents, other regulatory governments, other governments to regulate in a way that promotes a healthy public sphere because the First Amendment constrains our hands too much. Now, um, uh, under, current, uh, under current law though, we have a pretty laissez-faire First Amendment. The court over the last four decades has taken a very strong view of the constraints that the First Amendment uh, imposes on government actors. And when you hear about the Facebook Oversight Board and when you hear about the sort of uh, ambitious efforts at corporate self-regulation by the social media companies, some of that is emerging out of this background where under the current First Amendment law, there's tremendous amount of constraints on what the government can do, but there's basically no constraints on what private companies can do. And so when you, uh, Facebook is not constrained by the First Amendment, it is protected by the First Amendment, whereas Congress is significantly constrained by the First Amendment. Now, that doesn't mean that Congress necessarily can do nothing, as the Section 230 debates uh, make clear. Um, uh, the, the sort of the significant distinction that for um, 
people thinking about how the First Amendment intersects with all this is if we're assuming that Congress is acting or a government is acting, I'm, I'm going to assume the federal government because if we start talking about the states, there's complicated preemption questions, there's dormant commerce clause questions. I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A, but for now, let's just keep it relatively simple uh, just with the First Amendment. So let's assume it's the uh, federal government. Okay, so there are two major constraints that contemporary law imposes on the government when it regulates entities like the social media platforms. So one is that any uh, regulation that is considered to be content-based is going to trigger strict scrutiny, which it's very hard to survive under. And a content-based regulation is any law that treats some speech differently than other speech. So if Congress decides to um, make that, you know, lies, our Facebook and the other social media platforms really should not circulate lies on their platform. And so lies that circulate on social media, you know, trigger a civil or a criminal penalty. Um, that's gonna be virtually impossible, I think, for the government to sustain under a strict scrutiny analysis. The direct content-based regulation of speech on the platforms, to the extent that it extends beyond the um, the categories of speech that are already understood to be unlawful in other spheres, is going to be um, off the table. But, you know, I actually think that that's not such a bad thing. I mean, I think that there's a lot of questions we can ask about how we define, say, incitement and the First Amendment laws of lies. But I, it's not obvious to me that the rules for the social media companies should be different than the rules in general. And so uh, it's, this seems okay to me. And especially given what Kate said in the beginning about the transnational nature of these companies, do we really want Congress setting very distinctive speech rules that are not going to be the same as those in the EU or in Africa or in Australia. So I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. There is a second constraint, though, that the court has insisted on in the last four decades that's a little bit more complicated, and um, which is that the government is not allowed to interfere with the editorial autonomy of members of the press or media speakers. So the, this was first announced in a, in a case that had to do with newspapers, and the, the claim was that under the First Amendment, no interference with the editorial choices made by newspaper editors is permitted, like none. We're not talking about strict scrutiny, the language of the case, this is a Miami Herald publishing company versus Tonio, the case I love to hate. Um, it, it doesn't even uh, contemplate um, strict scrutiny. It just says, no, choices about, and I, I just, I want to uh, emphasize a little bit the breadth of the category that is off the table here for the government. It's not just choices about what content to include in the paper, because we might think that falls under the content-based regulation. The size of the paper, the shape of the paper, what to include, how to place things, any editorial choices, they're off the table. Now, Tornillo was a newspaper case, and um, it subsequently has not been applied to other forms of media, like the broadcast media, but the court has always said, oh, that, that's because of special cases. Tornillo has been interpreted, though, as kind of the default rule. And there's an there's a early internet case, Reno v. ACLU, in which there's the strong suggestion by, I think it's Justice Kennedy who's writing the majority opinion, that the Tornillo kind of rule would apply to the internet. But this is 1996, this is before the current era, who knows? So there's this question about, you know, does this rule apply in full force to social media companies? I think the conservative members of the court today would think it does. If it does, I think that's a big problem <laughs> because it means that not only can we not, uh, can Congress not say restrict lies on social media, but anything that interferes with the ability of the platforms to make choices about what appears on their platforms, the order in which uh, speech appears on their platforms, how speech circulates on their platforms, seems like it's raising very significant First Amendment problems. Um, I think that there's an argument that even uh, federally imposed transparency and due process obligations interferes with the editorial autonomy of the platforms and is going to um, run into the First Amendment. And I think that that, so that's a, that's a view out there. It's not an implausible view. I think there's going to be strong backers behind it. I think were Congress to engage in any um, any regulation other than Section 230 reform, which, well, probably including Section 230 reform, but let's bracket it. If we were trying to directly regulate, though, um, you know, the platforms, the choices that they make about deplatforming or the process that they give to users uh, to deplatform, or I think the elephant in the room, the big question about regulation here, which is, would we want a federal law that limits the ability of the platforms to amplify or prioritize speech? Because the distinctive feature of the platforms as social as 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 public forums, as opposed to newspapers, 
and radios is that they allow a lot of people to speak, but they're constantly making content-based decisions about what speech to amplify and prioritize and flag. And that's where we think a lot of the sort of distinctive both advantages and disadvantages of the social media forums emerges. So um, any law that tries to limit the ability of the platforms to prioritize or amplify speech is going to run into 20 or like a brick wall, and there's going to be a First Amendment challenge within zero to five seconds. Now, I, uh, so I, I, I guess I'll stop there because I've uh, said a lot. Um, I, I think that there's an alternative interpretation of the First Amendment that we could articulate for why those laws shouldn't necessarily be off the table. Uh, that I'm happy to expand upon. But I do think as of now, if we take that as the dominant interpretation of the law, it imposes very, very significant constraints on the ability of Congress uh, to regulate. I'll just add two footnotes to that, to the, to just the descriptive account. Um, uh, one of which is that, you know, uh, there is this trend in the state courts in, in deciding First Amendment challenges to revenge porn laws of mm -hmm. actually upholding laws under strict scrutiny. Now, my own thinking is that I, I have I have serious doubts any of those any of that analysis uh, uh, is is drawn upon by the actual by by the Supreme Court you know were they to actually hear one of these cases but the state Supreme Court seemed to seem to be okay with um, with applying strict scrutiny and finding that the law is, is nevertheless nevertheless okay um, yeah. but they don't have the last word on that so you know but but that's that's at least one trend that we're seeing. Um, and the other thing I'll note is that, you know, at the end of the day, just to be clear on what Tornillo was about, right, Tornillo was about a right of reply, this idea that, you know, if you were attacked, that, that the newspaper had to publish your response. Um, mm -hmm. And so it is possible to distinguish it as effectively a, a case about compelled speech rather than about the, the choices generally that they're making. Although I fully understand uh, the point that, that I don't think that's necessarily how the current Supreme Court will end up. Uh, will end up viewing the case. So, yeah, can I just say in response to that? I mean, I actually think that there's a lot of uh, open. I think it's by no means um, clear that Tonio could or should apply in the way I just suggested it. I think that there will be um, a lot of arguments made that it does. And I guess if I were a betting person, I would bet that it's likely that the majority in the court would interpret it this way. But you know, one of the reasons why it is so interesting thinking about the relationship between social media platforms, these content moderation questions of democracy right now, is I think we as a society and maybe globally are really having a moment of trying to think about the relationship between these things kind of with fresh eyes, right? There was for a long time this assumption that the best way to promote a healthy democratic public sphere and innovation and lots of good speech was just to stop the government from acting. This was a the kind of um, internet utopianism that we saw for maybe the first 10 to 15 years of the internet, even longer. And that went very, that went hand in glove with this Tornillo case, a strong interpretation of this Tornillo case and with the laissez-faire First Amendment. And so I think for a long time, people were just assuming that the First Amendment was basically encoding everything we, we would possibly want from both an innovation and a democracy perspective. Now our view obviously is, is very different. I think people have a much more jaded, maybe overly jaded, but at least, uh, uh, optimistically, much more nuanced view of the harms as well as the benefits of government laissez-faire when it comes to these platforms. And so we're just, this this, this um, discussion we're having right now is part of this ongoing series of conversations about how do we promote free speech in social media? Is it necessarily the best way to do it by tying the government's hands in all contexts? I think if that conversation results in a real change of view about how we understand free speech, which is what I wanted to do, I want us to under, to I want the view to be that we care about free speech, but free speech is not necessarily always anti-regulatory. That some forms of regulation can promote free speech, not just undermine it. I think if that view gets enough buy-in, the courts are receptive to changing political winds, and so it's possible to imagine judges, and maybe this is exactly what the state court judges you're talking about are listening to. As our uh, as popular consensus about what free speech does and should mean changes, courts are gonna be responsive to that. So I think doctrinally, there's a lot of room in the joints you could play with if you want to get to a result where you're gonna allow the government to regulate. And I'm, I'm I think maybe famous infamous being kind of optimistic about the space for poss the possibilities here. Um, I just think right now, as of now, um, the court, the Supreme Court and the federal courts remain very committed to a laissez-faire view of freedom of speech. And I think it's the job of uh, scholars like me, public intellectuals, civil society groups to s articulate to them why that's no good. <laughs>
Yeah. No, well, so I'm entirely on board both with the descriptive and the normative account that uh, that you give there. Um, but descriptively, of course, if we if we agree then that we think that the current court is going to largely restrict the government from acting. Now let's circle back around to, well, then what can we do with, even without the government, right? Um, so, you know, Facebook ha has has done some things, right? They Facebook in particular, and of course, um, you know, all the sites have have some forms of policies and procedures in place, right? But perhaps most elaborated here, um, with respect to with respect to what Facebook is looking like. Um, so let me throw it back to Professor Klonick to talk a little bit more about, you know, what what has Facebook done, and in particular, what about this new oversight board? And uh, maybe you could just start by just sort of describing it, right? But then also, then then from there we can talk about whether or not you are. I don't know, optimistic or pessimistic about the ways in which um, a board like this um, will will ultimately kind of help with 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 figuring out what the correct governance procedures will be. Yeah, well, I love I Jenny, that was awesome. I really like. I feel as if that kind of set everything up perfectly because you you're describing kind of the this narrow world and the, the well, I think of it as narrow, just given like the fact that I look around the world and I kind of think all the time about if the US decided to make this law, if the EU decided to make this law, if their court comes out in this way, interpreting right to be forgotten in this way, or the GDPR in this other way, or whatever, what are the implications of that going to be extraterritorially on other on the internet globally as like as a unit? And how are we going to move further away from any type of chance of kind of a tech utopia that we know doesn't really and won't ever really exist, but at least have the opportunity to still have like this open space um, and development. Uh, or are we going to, you know, are we going to basically confine things to borders and to like geo blocking and that type of thing and in some way balkanize the internet? Um, and maybe that's the outcome that we want and maybe that we lose a lot of information and a lot of speech if we if we if we if we do things that way um i i just generally think that when we're talking about the ways in which these companies are going to self-regulate one of the things that has been happening since they've they've really started was a, a uh, from civil society and outside sources, people urging for urging transparency, wanting to ha open the black box and have some type of idea of not only the rules that were being enforced on users, but how those rules were being enforced and how they were being updated. Um, and one of the interesting things um, about all of this is that yes, basically within their transnational jurisdiction, Facebook has all of these rules and they make some small carve outs for different areas and different types of um, different types of uh, rules for, you know, um, the Middle East or something like that, but those are few and far between. Um, and that generally speaking, they have created like this global set of rules that may or may not be anywhere close to what we would want it to be. Um, but what I guess, and so this is where I turn and talk about the oversight for it is, one of the things that Facebook has done that other places have not yet done is to decide to make their rules relatively public. I'm just, I know for a fact that there are still um, rules and in, like and training on rules of content moderators and types of documents that are not public documents and that like there's a lot of stuff that happens in kind of that space of trying to get people to be able to basically provide fact to fact case law instead of just a restatement to use it in like kind of a to put it in kind of uh, legal terms. You know, what we see as outsiders is a restatement of kind of the of the common law that has generated over time is like they like put up this nice shiny like summary. Um, and then uh, individual content moderators, people of like the 30,000 people that Facebook employs to do content moderation, they have a 300 page document that's full of facts that they that, that shows like, well, this counts as nudity, but this doesn't count as nudity back and forth or, or terrorist speech or anything else. So. Facebook basically has, um, starting around 2016, began to formalize its public policy um, process, and the rules that it was going to put up. And then in 2018, it published its rules pub publicly, um, the more detailed version of the rules. And then um, in November of 2018, Mark Zuckerberg announced that there was going to be um, what quote unquote the Facebook Supreme Court, the Facebook Oversight Board, which is going to be this outside independent body that Facebook helped set up, but then was completely independent from Facebook, that was going to be an outside adjudicator of the appeals um, that people had um, 
in within Facebook when their content was removed. And then they would be able to appeal it to this body. And if this body decided to hear it, they could get their content restored on Facebook. And this would provide also a va valuable signaling function back to Facebook about where its rules should be. Instead of a, like a, a room of people randomly picked in like Menlo Park, there would be this global body of experts that was making kind of a, a keeping in mind the global nature of the problem as they were deciding all of these things and were experts in freedom of expression and, and human rights. So this has been this kind of consist. So this has been this. Um, so starting in 2018, this was something that um, Mark was pushing for. Uh, I spent most of 2019 and part of 2020 watching this be set up internally with at, at Facebook as kind of an observer. And I wrote wrote up my findings in a law review article and a magazine article. And the um, and basically what you saw there is a a very process based approach to this this problem um and it's also this really interesting and i'm i'm i was surprised that you didn't mention this yet genevieve but this really interesting kind of melding of a public and private sphere it is creating essentially some type of third party body to adjudicate speech that is not facebook is not users is not um is not a government that is so i guess maybe fourth party <laughs> that is going to be uh, that is going to basically be adjudicating these types of decisions and is beholden to basically no one um i mean in its an ideal in its most ideal form um and the institutional structure of it we can go into at some length it has 130 million dollars that was given that's enough to, for, to have it run for for two terms of board members so that's like around six years and it's an irrevocable gift that Facebook um, Facebook made to the tr to a trust, and then the the board uses that money. The board, when they finally selected all the members, is just this incredible kind of blue ribbon um, panel of people that were uh, Nobel Prize winners, former Prime Minister of of Denmark. Uh, uh, you know, a bunch of law professors, people that a lot of us know. Um, former circuit judges, uh, you know, the former editor in chief of the Guardian. I mean, it goes on and on. It was 20 people, and it was incredibly global, and it was incredibly diverse. Um, and it'll grow to be 40 over the next year, um, and that'll be kind of the maximum size of the board. Um, but you asked Felix if I was uh, Professor Ruth. I was. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not used to call you that. Uh, uh, there is. Um, you asked if I was optimistic or pessimistic. Um. I, I would say like, and I've always said this since the beginning, I think that people think that I'm very optimistic about this or that I'm pro oversight board because I've spent so much time on it or that like, like, I don't really care whether the Facebook oversight board lives or dies if it's decided that this is not going to be a fruitful enterprise or it turns out to be corrupt or it turns out to just be a puppet or a Potemkin village or like, you know, something or, a, you know, something else for Facebook. That's not like what I'm interested in. The thing that I'm optimistic about is any type of new avenue for users to have a voice and to have power. Because as we were talking about all of this, like the various power, the News Corp power, the Google power, the Facebook power, the power of the US government, the power of the EU, like one of the things that is kind of missing in that is like the, is the, is the underlying user and their ability to have kind of a direct say in this increasingly global world that they're living in instead of having a proxy vote through either being a member of one of these platforms or a citizen of one of these countries. And I just think that they're having something that's more, now, that being said, the oversight board is not quite that. It is not a representative body. It is not elected. The people who get selected are not like, you know, they're not representing the voices of the people. Like that, there is like a court, and there are like counter majoritarian difficulties that go along with that. But I think that there's, it is a, it is a, it is a moment. It is like a tiny wedge, a tiny divestment of power that Facebook has given up, and acknowledged that it needs to give up, and it is in Facebook's best interest to give it up. And so, like, all of that being said, there's no reason why this couldn't be something great. And I think that that's more or less what I kind of hold out for is that like, I am an optimist just by nature. So I would call this cautious optimism and I wait for it to be seen, but I will turn on this thing like that if it turns out to be some type of horribly corrupt or like 
or very problematic uh, group, or if it really goes against all of the wishes of, for which it was created and the intentions that it was created. So that's kind of um, where I'll leave it. Can I add to that? Because I thought it was really helpful. Um, so the, I guess for the students here, maybe you don't uh, know, but the sort of debate about the Facebook Oversight Board is incredibly contentious. People take very strong views, I think in part because of this uh, belief, you know, very different uh, conceptions of what it's doing. So there are people who think it's just sort of under Facebook's thumb, it's just a means of um, garnering legitimacy for the corporation. And then there are others like Kate and myself who think it's this interesting experiment that is doing a thing that really no one else is doing, as far as I know, which is looking in detail about and trying to understand in a detailed manner the rationale, the justifications for the specific um, content moderation rules that Facebook has adopted. Now you can, so I'm, I'm with Kate, I'm thinking that this could be, this is an interesting experiment and it's doing something that other groups are not doing. And we, on the other hand, we know from the history of other kinds of uh, media corporations that this isn't the first time that media self-regulation has been sort of the primary mechanism of uh, making content moderation decisions. And it isn't even the first time that a corporation faced with kind of public outrage about how it runs its business has set up something that looks kind of independent and kind of quasi-judicial. So the NBC Radio um, Corporation, which was the dominant player in radio broadcasting in the early 20th century. I mean, I think today, students today may think radio, no big deal, who cares about the radio? But in the early 20th century, it is the major democratic innovative technology of communication and NBC dominates it. It creates an advisory council that does something along the same lines of what Facebook, the Facebook Oversight Board is doing now. Um, but then ultimately, you know, with the looking back on history, what we, I think, and it was also stock, um, stock full of really prominent and important people, including the future Chief Justice of the US Supreme Court. So the parallels are very striking. But if we look back at what it was doing, we can say on the one hand, there was a really interesting conversation, really early conversation about how radio should be regulated that has long and deep um, connections to how radio continued to be regulated for the rest of the 20th century. So the advisory council was significant and it was reasoned. And so we can think that there's a lot of value in what it did. But ultimately looking back, it was under the thumb of NBC. And so the, the its um, advice was taken to the extent that it was beneficial for NBC's bottom line. And primarily NBC didn't wanna be identified as partisan. These, uh, everything, everyone should hear the echoes to the contemporary debates, really, this anxiety, I think, that the platforms have, or that Facebook certainly had prior to the election about seeming to be anti-conservative, that maybe led it to actually be very pro-conservative in its uh, decisions with respect to, say, President Trump and um, other, uh, um, other users. And so we might think that the NBC Advisory Council did important work that no one else was doing, but also because it was corporate owned and controlled with some separation, but nevertheless, ultimately um, under the aegis of the corporation, um, maybe did not produce the most, um, the best um, speech decisions. And so I think one might think Facebook Oversight Board is a really powerful indication that something like this is needed. We need, we need something. And maybe because the first man and the government cannot do it itself. And it's also a little bit difficult to imagine Congress doing this in a reasonable fashion because of the deep partisan divides. But um, Facebook Oversight Board makes me want to imagine other groups doing similar kinds of things that are not so beholden to uh, the corporation, one corporation or any corporation. And if we look back again at the early 20th century, we see sort of the New Deal period, all kinds of public private partnerships where um, regulated entities would come together with civil society representatives and representatives from government and try and fashion rules of the road for their relevant industries. And actually the history of those groups is a mixed one. It didn't always work. I think trying to figure out how to do this in a way that is both um, expert in the way that the Facebook Oversight Board is and democratically accountable is actually very difficult. Like democratic considerations and demands and technocratic or expert driven considerations and demands may push in different directions. Uh, but I think that is the really the, in the immediate term, I think that's the regulatory challenge here. So I want to follow up on that in one second, but um, but but before I do, I, there's a couple of questions in the in the in the Q and A here that I think are are relevant to before we move on, right? Um, with somebody asking, so what kind of enforcement authority or teeth does the oversight board have? What prevents Facebook from ignoring its decisions or recommendations? 
um, and, and more generally just in, in terms of thinking about, well, what is the relationship between the decisions they issue and what Facebook's policies are gonna be going forward? Um, so, yeah. yeah, sure. So right now their jurisdiction is small. It's ex it's jurisdiction is fairly small. It is Instagram and Facebook and it is single object content that is taken down. And what I mean by single object, co object content is a photo or a video or a status update. It's not pages. It's not everything else. Those are the, That is the jurisdiction of things users can appeal to the board. Facebook can send whatever it wants. And there's three different ways that Facebook can send um, things to the board and they can send them with different balances. One is a general policy request in which they can ask the board just for kind of like their policy advice. And they don't, Facebook doesn't have to hand to listen to that. Facebook can go to the board and say, we have an expedited request for an emergency piece of content and we want your take on this. And if they use that function, they have to listen to what the board says and have to implement what the board says for them to do. And the third one is just kind of an in-between. It's like basically a the Facebook oversight board can find any individual user's um, problem or individual piece of content that they think illustrates a greater point that they are tr struggling with and use that and recommend that case to the board, in which case they, again, don't have to, to listen to the board's recommendation. That being said, there is then if users appeal and that was the first thing that i mentioned when users appeal and their content has been removed facebook or is obligated to if the board tells them to put that individual user's post back up they have to put that individual user's post back up then facebook has some type of vague kind of commitment that is not really a commitment at all it's as if we can and it makes sense for us to do this we will take down similar content in similar contexts and try to like remove this, if it's something that a lot of people have posted, they'll try to like go through and take it down. Um, and then they basically, any policy recommendations that the board might make alongside a, alongside a recommendation to put back up someone's content or to take, or, or an affirmation that they, the content should have been taken down, they can make policy recommendations. Like we think that you should create this type of proportionality scale. We think that there should be this. And then Facebook within 30 days, has to respond to the board to tell them whether or not they decide how they've decided to implement those changes and whether or not um, and how exactly they did them or why they decided not to. It is a form of weak form review that is, uh, as kind of Mark Tisha has like has talked about frequently, that is um, more is not you're correct there is no like direct enforcement power except in this really narrow circumstances but i would argue and i think that most people would argue that really the real power here comes from from the from the public and transparent nature of having and having a public process around this and the fact that facebook has just spent 130 million dollars in two years setting this all up getting together some of the most prestigious people in freedom of expression and international human rights all over the world to put their reputations on the line for it, that if they're not going to listen to this, that's going to be really bad news for Facebook in terms of PR. Um, and so granted that is, that is at the end of the day, like only what it is, PR is only what it is. Like I totally understand that, but when you have a bottom line and your entire business model is about eyeballs on ads, having a reputational collapse like that is really dangerous. So I just, I think that that is just, that's kind of, that's the answer to the kind of the teeth of the board. Which of course is the limits to self, to self-governance in the first place, right? I mean, like the whole point of the limit to self-governance is that at the end of the day, it all comes back to you in some way. Right. That's exactly yeah. correct. And I mean, like, that's just, I mean, and you know, and, you know, and uh, do, would we want it any differently? Do we want to arm Facebook so they can like, you know, there's like, there's like various questions of like basically how the state has power of, over us as individuals anyways. And right. And that one of those, one of those things is like actual physical control, but obviously we don't want that here. Mm -hmm. So let me come back to around to, you know, the, the, the bit of a conversation that was developing. Cause I, I think one of the things that's, that is super interesting here is also just to think about, um, Sort of the 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 flow here. I mean, because at some point, uh, at, at some point, Kate, you described you know described the board as being beholden to no one, right? And somehow is this this entity separate from from like Facebook, from like the big media companies, separate from the government, and it's just kind of like in there itself. But as you point out, right at the end of the day, maybe the thing that we'd really be looking for, maybe, um, is is some sort of uh, uh, ability for the users themselves to participate. Um, 
So any thoughts on what that would look like? Like how one might think about what it would mean for user participation, right? Um, you know, and one way to think about this is like we've set up this entire conversation, this entire panel around the notion of governance, right? And like the 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 key the key concept of governance usually when we think about governance is some idea about you know the individuals being governed having some say in the in the governance there. So how do we think about that? Are there any options? I don't you know and and this is again one of those places where I I am just really like open to ideas because I have no idea how this could possibly work. Um, are, are there options? And and as as uh, as Genevieve was pointing out, is it even a good idea to get to get people involved? Oh not. my God, it's such a great question. So one of the things that I've been kind of revisiting um, lately is kind of some of these old Madisonian ideas of like, of kind of just as like Genevieve talked about, like, that do we want something to be perfectly representational and like what happens? And so like, I will bring you back to 2009, which was approximately 10 million years ago. <laughs> and, uh, and um 2009, Mark Zuckerberg sat on a couch. He was in a one-year challenge to always wear a tie. So he looked like, like a child, like a baby-faced, like, kid and had him, like, the shirt and tie. And he's, like, leaning into the camera and he's just like, we at Facebook want to have, like, it was called the Facebook Governance Project. And it was a direct opportunity to have a direct, it was a perfect it was like a referendum democracy you vote on your terms of service they gave the opportunity they put all of the terms of service up on the chopping block and people could vote on them and uh no one voted it was like literally ten thousand people of the two billion people on facebook uh voted in this thing it was like 0.012 percent or something and it didn't even reach the quorum level that it needed that that had agreed to that would make it binding. And so there just was no participation whatsoever. Um, fast forward to the question of whether we would have wanted it to work, because I think that Genevieve brings up a really great point, which is just that like, there is right now, I feel like the thing that we're trying and we're at one of the things we're trying and getting the platforms to protect us from is from kind of this outrage culture, this culture that there, it, there are no mediators, that like, every that there is this shaming mob that there is like all of these types of very um very kind of uh sometimes terrifying uses of content and groups and factions of content that are spreading all over the internet and that we want there to be some type of like pushback on and so like i think it's a great question i will say as i was thinking as you were kind of recap recapitulating what i said though that they do have a little bit of a check which is that they would stop getting paid by the trust uh but the trust was created and has taught all of the reasons uh and the trustees is empowered to serve the purpose of the oversight board so like if at some point this group goes hangwire and leaves that purpose behind the trustees could, in theory, I guess, stop paying them. And that is maybe something to think about. And the other thing to think about regarding the trust is that it's a giant pile of money and that if maybe someday the oversight board thinks that what, what the oversight board needs is an oversight board legislature, that that might be something that the trust is, has to start creating. Um, and that come, if that comes from outside Facebook, that would be kind of great, right? If it could totally set itself up as like a as a as I'm, we're talking like many years down the road but this is just kind of where my mind goes with these questions can i add a few things because i also think that's a really great question um so i have two different points um some they don't flow to, so i'll just say both of them so one is when thinking about the transparency point about that the facebook oversight board itself its primary power is publicity is transparency that it's allowing users um, I guess potential regulators, voters to have an assessment of what Facebook is doing. So we can think either that that's good in and of its, well, it is good in and of itself, uh, but of course it only applies to Facebook, right? Although Facebook has invited other platforms to participate there, they have so far chosen not to do so. And still the transparency is subject is under Facebook's control. So Facebook does announce its, how it's gonna be applying the policies, but it does so in a way that it has chosen to do so sometimes quite, it's quite hard to figure out exactly what actions it's taken. In terms of transparency, one might imagine a lot more biting transparency than the, the because the board, although the Facebook oversight board is to some degree independent, there is separation as uh, institutional 
um, separation between the board and the company writ large, it's still Facebook that is publicizing and communicating the information about the board to the public, about its responses to the board. So we might think that the, the board's really interesting, but it's also a really useful indication of how we might want to regulate other platforms generally. That uh, it seems to me that transparency is a really important um, issue for regulators to be thinking about that is to some degree, I think, lost in Section 230 reforms right now. I mean, there's a lot of focus on um, the objectionable content, and there's some focus, as I said earlier, on due process rights to users, but there's been relatively little conversation about how the way to make um, the sort of regulation of these companies, may, maybe make the sort of content moderation decisions better without having to do sort of direct government mandates is by requiring more transparency. And so to the extent that Facebook itself thinks that this is the primary way in which it should be bound, we might take that seriously and think, well, maybe the government should apply those transparency mandates, make those make that a mandate of some sort and apply it to the other platforms. In terms of this terrific question about sort of um, user participation and democracy on the platforms, I mean, I think that um, we would want the, uh, in a democratic society, we obviously want there to be popular buy-in and accountability and the people to have a, have a say. But of course, the decisions we made here are incredibly complicated and the sheer scale of, of decisions means we have to think about error rates. We have to think about sort of systemic effects. The, these are things that it's really hard. I mean, thinking about the idea in 2009, people would just vote up or down on a policy without really knowing anything about the larger environment that they're trying to regulate and the downsides and the costs. I mean, it seems kind of crazy. So the California I mean, proposition system for what it's worth, but you know, in yeah, which has its advantages, but has very serious disadvantages too. So I think the, the, the ideal would be to put expertise in conversation with democratic accountability. And historically, the way we've done that is we have, you know, agencies that are chock full of experts, but they have to make their findings public. They have to open up uh, to notice and comment. There is public engagement, but there is also, but it's all mediated through a lot of sort of expert driven judgment. So I think that's the idea, that's what we would want to be mimicking here. And I, there has been some suggestions about having a kind of federal digital agency like the FCC before the platforms, but you could also, if we want to take it outside of government, you could imagine a civil society organization playing the role of the Facebook oversight board, uh, but making, having sort of more uh, direct engagement with the public. I guess I'll just say though, Facebook Oversight Board also is open to public comments and the public comment process so far has been relatively robust. I mean, I think they've gotten thousands of comments in response to the it's question. Been, it's the been day. incredibly robust. I wanna also say, Genevieve, sorry, but just since you're mentioning this, they didn't have to do public comments. That wasn't something that was specifically put into, and I remember the conversation about whether or not it was going to be put into the charter and bylaws. Like that, and Facebook was like, no, if we do this, it's not gonna be independent. They have to decide like whether they want that to be part of their thing. And like, they, I love that they decided to do this. I think it was such a great move. Yeah, and I, I think the sheer engagement with the process suggests that there is real hunger for an institution of the sort. However skeptical you may be of the Facebook Oversight Board itself, it is clear that it is serving as the um, focal point of a lot of energy and anxiety and concerns. And many of the letters that have been submitted as part of the um, public comment process have been fabulous. I mean, there's just really a lot of really good conversation occurring right now in and outside the Facebook Oversight Board about content moderation. So, so I think it seems pretty clear that you wouldn't want somehow to, to set it up in such a way that the users themselves were the ones making the choices that we're having the oversight board right make, right? That seems clearly a, a mismatch there. Um, but I guess the question might be, but could you imagine having the oversight board members be elected? Like, would that be a good or a bad thing if we had them, if we had them elected? <laughs> I love that ever this ever addressing this in papers because it gives me a chance to cite to Bodie McBoatface, uh, which was the famous. Do you guys remember this? The famous <laughs> referendum of like naming the boat. Uh, the it was like naming some boat and like I forget where it was even. Britain. Genevieve yes. it was in Britain. Yeah, yeah. And like they put up a name Bodie McBoatface. I, I love it. I, but it's like I mean, come on. I mean, yes, it is like phenomenal in like many, many levels. But okay, so those not familiar, this was the story of there was a referendum to decide how to name this like this like new boat that was in like the British fleet. 
um, when they opened and like someone jokingly submitted the name Bodie McBoatface and it got voted the most, it got it, like went viral and got the most votes, right? And it was hilarious and very fun, but it's also kind of like the most perfect kind of like, well, if we're really designing like an entire system of governance that protects people against both genocide and like authoritarian governments, like, do we really want to have like Bodie McBoatface? Like, I love Bodie McBoatface, don't get me wrong, but like, I think that there's a time and the place for referendums. And like, I'm not sure how, I'm not sure how um, creating free speech policy um, is going to go if you decide that that's how you're going to do it. Okay, or, or somewhere in between. So I let's, I mean, again, let's think about other governance models, right? Um, you know, so, um, uh, for example, think about think about certain like um, um, uh, corporate boards, university boards, boards of trustees, there are often situations in which what you have instead is maybe, you know, um, not direct user control over the nominations, and therefore you avoid the Bodie McBoatface problem, right, because there's been some mechanism by which we've already established how one even gets onto the slate in the first place, right. Um, and then, for, but then from there, we'll, we'll we'll really we'll put it to a true and genuine vote, and then you you know you 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 vote among the uh, among the options. And when I say options, I mean among the people who are going to serve on the board, right? So so that might you know again that you know the question is you know whether there are ways to to pull in kind of user engagement, user participation here that will both um, create the appropriate amount of insulation from the ultimate ultimate decisions that are being made, and yet somehow inject a certain amount of user participation, user legitimacy almost as it were into the into the overall process. Yeah, I mean, there's long been critiques of the American um, system of corporate governance, right? That there's democracy for the shareholders. And I guess I'll put democracy in quotes because there are all kinds of um, limitations to even how effective that democracy is, especially when you have the corporate, the divisors of the corporation have a lot of room to move when it comes to um, um, who votes, how to participate. But Still, there is some kind of a democracy for shareholders, but we're not accustomed to thinking about corporate democracy should include workers or should include consumers. And it is interesting to think about a more expansive conception of corporate democracy if we don't think that the government can, maybe because of the First Amendment, directly regulate, and big asterisk, maybe it can, but leaving that aside. If we think that the something like the Facebook Oversight Board suggests that all the energy is in corporate self-regulation, well, that could mean something very anemic if we're just, that, that just means the CEO gets to make all the shots, as seems clear here. Yeah, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg just was like, yes, let's make a Supreme Court. And he did it, right? That's not democratic buy-in. But we could reimagine the how we think about corporations and really democratize them, these corporations in significant ways. And so Felix, I think those suggestions are, are interesting, not just because of the immediate problem that they might solve, which is to give more democratic accountability, or I guess quasi-democratic accountability, because it's not based on citizenship, it's based on users, but also because it suggests a sort of, it's a pretty radical um, change to how we think democracy in the corporate sphere might or could look like. It's a much more expansive conception, and that's pretty attractive to me. Yeah, I mean, I think there's some very interesting, you know, ways in which, again, I mean, the way we started this whole conversation, right, is to think about it as a governance problem and the way in which we might um, you know, draw analogies to other forms of governance, right? Both the state governance and corporate governance and, and nonprofit governance and all sorts of other forms of governance and thinking like what kind of structure might we want to put together? Yeah, I get, this, oh, sorry. Can I just say in response to that though, I mean, I do think that there is this first order question, which is, do we want the governors to be the corporations or do we want it to be the public government? Because the, right, I mean, and I'm not sure. I think this conversation, there's a lot of, well, this is kind of our conversation that we've been having over the last couple of weeks, Genevieve, which is just like, which I love, which is like, like, let's talk about this, like blurring this public private line mm -hmm. and creating a better, a better mechanism that doesn't bucket the type of governance you use and your motivations to just market or just like, or just kind of protection and safety, or just like put these like, you know, those aren't the only modalities. And that complicates the question and decides that we're going to make different types of like meet different types of affordances. We have a new type of speech and a new type communication tool that has created, has totally changed the affordances that speech used to be based on. So like, maybe it's time that like, we had a different type set of like governance systems that reflects that. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, and then I, 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 I had one more thing I wanted to, oh, oh right. Um, and so then, and then even apart from the, from the, the kind of governance or self-governance model, the other thing I wanted to follow up on was this idea of um, what about the possibility of actually regulating, right? What about the possibility of, of you know, some 
actual government oversight of the governance procedures and the like, right? And one of the things that Genevieve was sort of suggesting here is what about a transparency obligation? Um, so, so maybe you could just say a few more words about whether or not you are any more optimistic about the, the, the you know, being able to impose a transparency obligation with respect to arguments about you know, not probably so much Section 230, but with respect to the First Amendment, right? Um, then with respect to kind of, you know, uh, uh, larger forms of, of regulation of the platforms uh, more generally. Um, so I think it's complicated. So the First Amendment has not historically been understood to limit the ability of the government to demand information from companies. So uh, the government can have transparency obligations to some degree in that and we know that it's constantly getting information on social media platforms that we may we, we may have very complicated feelings about. Uh, but by transparency, I meant public facing transparency. So where the companies have to give up information such that the users, the citizens can have information about what they're doing. And that's more complicated. So there is a case, IMS Health v. Sorrell, a relatively recent case, this court, the Roberts Court, um, in which there was a Vermont law that prohibited the sale of data about physician prescribing practices to uh, basically pharmaceutical marketing companies, uh, in part because of concerns about manipulation and harassment by those companies but allow the use of that, the, the giving of that data to public health researchers, because you can be used for all kinds of things. And the court says, no, no, this distinction you're drawing is a form of um, speaker-based discrimination. You're discriminating against advertisers in favor of public health researchers. So um, any kind of transparency requirement that would say require data be disclosed to public health researchers, but not that be then commodified ra will raise First Amendment red flags, whether or not just a general law that like um, the companies put out quarterly transparency reports akin to the kinds of things that Facebook has been doing, that seems to me less problematic. I guess I think for that to be successful, the devil is really going to have to be in the details. I mean, this goes to a little bit of Kate's point about democracy. You know, if it's just the public without any kind of expert mediation, um, I don't know how well people are going to be able to assess the information that they received. And I worry, I mean, right now, the thing about the Facebook transparency reports is I'm not quite sure how successful they are at actually communicating information. There's just sort of like bulk statistics. You don't really know what's going on. And so I don't think that the First Amendment necessarily is such a limitation on that, although I'm sure there would be a First Amendment challenge, but I think it, it could be defeated. I think the challenge there is designing a good transparency obligation regime, but I think it's very promising. I mean, one could even imagine, you know, you know, what would it be look, look like to mandate something like the oversight board, right? To mandate the whole board, but maybe that's okay because at the end of the day, it doesn't have any actual enforcement mechanism, right? I mean, would that make for an okay, therefore an okay uh, sort of thing? No, because of course it does have some enforcement teeth. It it tells Facebook you have to take down the speech or not take down, put the speech back up. But it's and just PR at the end of the day that finds them to do it, right? What? But it's just PR at the end of the day that binds them to do it. And so what I'm saying is require uh, them to set up an oversight board, but uh, not provide any government backing to the uh, outcomes of the board, right? So that would be the idea. So that, so that therefore the lack of government enforcement of the board's decisions, uh -huh. wouldn't, wouldn't that then insulate it from First Amendment challenges? No, I mean, nothing's going to insulate it from First Amendment well, challenges. I mean, you know, it's going to be more okay than First Amendment. Well, but I mean, then you have to have like a legitimate end. It, it, that would be, a, it's interesting. It's complicated though, because of course this would require all kinds of labor and cost. And it would, it would of course constrain the discretion of the company to some degree. So you would have to make an argument that this, you're getting your bang for your buck. It's not irrational or unreasonable for Congress to be doing this. It is interesting. I mean, and this also raises this question about if that is what, if you do, if you are, are thinking about transparency mandates, um, how specific do we want to be to each platform? Because of course the platforms ha have themselves have different affordances. They're doing different kinds of things. There's this overarching question, which we haven't even touched on here, but which is also a very complicated one, which is how much do we want uniform rules when it comes to the media platforms? And how much we do don't. we want <laughs> We don't want uniform rules. <laughs> yeah. But, I, but, you know, I want there to be much more conversation about transparency because I'll just, let me give a little shtick for why I think it's so important. So one is it allows content moderation, platform decision-making to be more democratically accountable, even if it's still being um, decided by private actors rather than government actors. And it gets us to this kind of interesting public-private um, sort of mixed system that um, Kate was talking about. 
Um, but also the thing that I like about another thing about transparency is that it allows a dynamic system of speech regulation. So we are still, I think, in the very early days of making sense of the social media or the internet as a public sphere. And this is why I don't actually want there to be much direct content-based speech regulation, because we just, I think we still don't know this. There should be no consensus about what's good speech or bad speech, what are good speech policies or bad speech policies when it comes to the social media platforms, because they're emerging, they're developing, they're changing. We don't really know. So a transparency regime doesn't um, bind any platform to any particular rule. It simply means that there's constant in a discussion, conversation, information circulating about how well the rules that they have are working. And so it allows a kind of feedback loop or a kind of dynamic system of internet regulation that I think we really should be trying to work towards because we have to recognize that both we, uh, the system as is has serious problems, but on the other hand, we don't really know the solution to those problems. And so we just want a system that's gonna get us closer to the solution rather than further away. Right, which again, at the end of the day, right, is again a, a, a you know a, a plug, as it were, for the importance of governance as the you know as the as the overall kind of overarching framework within which to think of it, rather than the you know rather than the individual substance of the individual right. uh, individual questions. Um, let me let me throw in a few of the questions that we're getting from the the question and the answer box here. Um, uh, the first of which is from Monroe Price, who who writes, I think, what is more of a comment, but let's see if there's any reactions to it. I see this as a real Habermasian question. What is meant by a public sphere which affects a decision-making body? Um, here, the oversight board. So users can, through, organization, through organizations, become a public sphere. Uh, my sense is that there is emerging a somewhat sophisticated public sphere with people like the panelists, the commentator, commenters, et cetera. Any reactions? Yeah. Um, also, hi, Monroe, nice to see you. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I once was, wa I was on a train on the way to Yale where I was getting my PhD and I had the privilege of being like, is that Monroe Price sitting across from me on the, on the Metro North? And then it was. Uh, <laughs> so, um, the, uh, but I think this is a great question. And I agree. I think Habermas is all over this problem. If like you're familiar with Habermas, but just generally the idea of kind of like the, the public private sphere that I was kind of talking about and how we're drawing that line. Um, and I think that, I think to your point, I would say that in the last five years, I would say that like to a certain extent, my very short and young career is like a little bit of a testament to this, is that like, you know, I started this work in 2015 and no one was paying attention to it and people didn't think it was a legal issue and people didn't think that it was anything, that there was that much for for legal systems to say about about kind of how this was being policed and i think that just in you know and then two years later like you know mark zuckerberg was testifying in congress um about exactly how he was managing content moderation on his site um and so i think that there is i think we're in a period of to that point, I just think that we're in a period of massive public education and norm setting. Um, as Genevieve said, it's really bad to kind of create rules where you don't even understand the system that you're that you're regulating and you don't understand how the rule that you're creating is going to uh, have an effect on the system that you're regulating. Um, and so I think that we are in a period of norm setting of figuring out what these companies are going to be, what we want to think of them as, because I don't think we know yet. Um, and I think we're just at the cusp of figuring it out. And I, I just, I think that, I know this is like never the answer people want, but I just think it's going to kind of, to a certain extent, take more discussions like this and more time. Great. Um, here's, here's another. So, and I think this, this, you know, this is about one thing in particular, but it sort of raises some broader issues too. Um, how will the Facebook Oversight Board handle online radicalization from content on Facebook that's not problematic as a single post, but becomes problematic when it is repeated and empirically determined to raise the likelihood of politically motivated violence? Um, so I think there's a few things to think about here, right? One of which is like, you know, how do we, how do we handle sort of larger scale issues that are not at the level of individual posts. But I mean, I think also, I mean, I think one thing to just think about and point out here also is, right, there's an asymmetry, at least in the way the board is currently constructed um, with respect to um, uh, posts that are taken down versus posts that stay up, right? So um, so that too, that too is perhaps part of this question as well. Anyway, so any thoughts or reactions on that? Can I just say one thing about that? Uh, maybe not specifically answering the question, but I, I do think it points to um, a regulatory choice that Facebook made that we might want to revisit if we're thinking about the board as a kind of ex exemplary institution that we might want to model, which is this choice between a 
rulemaking versus a kind of um, decision, a court, court structure. So when it comes to federal agencies, there's often this question, is a federal agency going to operate by rulemaking or is it going to be operating by making individual decisions? There's a lot of advantages. I mean, all the lawyers and law students in the room know you are you're learning the case method. There's supposed to be a lot of advantage from the sort of concreteness of specific facts, but there are a lot of disadvantages, which is that these kinds of questions are much harder for judicial bodies to assess than when you are making generalizable rules. And so to the extent that we think that the problems on social media are systemic problems that are problems produced by say amplification, by the way in which information travels, not necessarily by the goodness or badness of the, in, the individual post, we might actually want to revisit this choice, this initial choice to make a Supreme Court rather than a Supreme Congress for Facebook or for the other platforms. Uh, Kate, any thoughts on any any thoughts on this? No, yeah, I, I actually really liked Genevieve's point. I do think that there is, you know, I, I do think that I do think that the the problem of that 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 was that idea of like one post becoming viral or creating kind of a new like a new valence of what it means versus what it meant in the initial stages when it was posted um, is kind of true of all language what we see is this happening more frequently because of the nature of these communications tools and so i think that just taking that into account like might be precisely the level of detail that we need to get into uh, maybe there is, maybe there are limits to virality that we want to create. Maybe that is, maybe there's only so many times that something can be posted or reposted uh, in, in, in some like a type of initial way. And maybe we're just okay if something gets 10,000 10, likes or 10,000 reach, and that, then it gets cut off. Like you can't comment on it anymore. You can't spread it. You can't like it. You can't do whatever. Um, I, I don't know, like these are just, but these are the types of conversations I just think that we really need to be having. We need to be having them with the engineers that design these platforms and the people that control like the actual mechanics of the platforms because it is all, it's, you know, it's very lessig, this problem. It is the dot and we are constrained by like, not just law, but like, and you know, in fact, if anything, this this conversation I think today has shown us how little we're constrained by law <laughs> and how little law might be able to, to constrain us or solve this and how those a lot of these things are going to come from changes in norms and and public pressure and architecture um, and markets so that's you know something to be to be wary of one more which i think follows on the same thread from from both what you're just saying and and from this last question uh, might regulation that limits platforms processing of personal data that they use to profile users for viral susceptibility survive first amendment scrutiny because of danger to civil society um, so again, two uh, two thoughts I think that are encapsulated here. One is the idea of like directly regulating really the the processing, right? The algorithmic stuff that Genevieve was sort of describing there before, um, but then also trying to think about whether or not then then you know how does that fit with kind of First Amendment scrutiny and the like. Yeah, I mean, it's been a really naughty, thorny question about what the First Amendment implications for privacy regulation are, in part in wake of that case I talked about earlier, the Sorrell case, which was couched as privacy regulation, but was interpreted by the court as disc speech dis content discrimination. And there've been tons and tons of cases since then um, in which there have been similar kinds of privacy laws that have been challenged on First Amendment grounds. And so if the aim of the privacy restriction on the platform's ability to gather user data is to limit their ability to target advertising, that's going to immediately raise First Amendment flag, because like this rel law, it's going to be read as a way of through the back door, regulating advertising, and that's a kind of speech regulation that's going to be difficult on First Amendment. Not impossible, but it's going to make uh, the judicial scrutiny more difficult. I do think, though, general privacy regulations could help some to some degree with this with this problem, because if we think that what's powering a lot of the sort of flood from the traditional journalism to um, the platforms talk about the nature of our public sphere. One profound thing that's happening to our public sphere is this crisis of traditional commercial journalism that is in part produced by the ability of these platforms to capture user data and to use it to, talk, to give it to advertisers to target advertising. Limiting that to the extent that we just think it's important on privacy grounds could have all these knock-on effects on the nature of speech on the platforms. Um, and so I, you know, I think in general, it's a good idea on privacy grounds, but um, I don't think it would be immune to First Amendment challenge. I think it's possible though that it would succeed against a First Amendment challenge.
one small coda from me, which is, um, you know, my own view is that if it's uh, a commercial processing of, of commercial data, that is to say, data that's ultimately going to be used for advertising purposes, it should actually be subject to zero First Amendment scrutiny. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in more, you can find my article called The Commercial Difference on that point. So, mm -hmm. um, okay, I think, I think that's all the time we've got. Let me just throw it back to Michael Pollack for a quick close. Yeah, so thank you to so much to our three panelists, Professor Lake here, Professor Klonick, Professor Wu. This was a really, really engaging and thought-provoking and informative conversation. It's great to just watch three scholars so deeply invested in this material talk about it just to be, you know, a fly on the wall in the room, I think, is what we were all able to do today. And that was a lot of fun. So on behalf of Cardozo, the Florsheimer Center, the Heyman Center, Cardozo Women in Tech Law, the Cardozo Data Law Initiative, thank you all for being here with us. Thanks to the audience for joining us. And uh, have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Thanks. That was so fun.